Welcome back to another round of Space News Updates from me. This week, Starbase expansion at the Kennedy Space Center continues, the iconic Boca Chica construction tents could soon be dismantled, and some design changes have been spotted for upcoming Starship fuel tanks. We saw a successful electron launch from Rocket Lab's brand new Pad B at Launch Complex 1, a meteorology satellite was launched by an Atlas V, SpaceX pulled off another successful Starlink mission, and more. Let's kick things off. In the world of Starbase, work continues at a good pace down at Boca Chica. Brendan Lewis's production diagrams always provide a great overview into the happenings at Starbase. This week, he's produced this nifty little infographic as well. The starship on the left here is a schematic sporting the brand new dome design that's been spotted at Starbase. This dome is similar to the newest generation of nose cone designs that we've seen, made from far fewer pieces of metal to create a smoother, simpler and presumably more robust structure. As you can see, the new dome, using the common dome here as an example, contains far fewer parts and, due to its much smaller profile, hopefully this means a similarly sized starship with this design can contain more fuel and therefore more payload than a starship with the old dome design. We probably won't see this new dome design integrated into a vehicle anytime soon though. First of all, SpaceX will likely want to build test tanks to validate the design like how we've seen before, such as with the SN7 line of prototypes. Last week we also also had some more cryo tests of Booster 4 and Ship 20. It is surprising to still see Ship 20 undergo cryo tests, but given the big changes that SpaceX have had to start making to the fuel farm, and of course the ongoing development of the fuel delivery systems for the launch pad, these cryo tests are probably more related to testing the functions of Stage 0 now, rather than the vehicles themselves. Although, I'm sure SpaceX were pleased to see that the structural integrity of Ship 20 and Booster 4 remains good after the recent full stack that was performed for Elon's Starship update, a stack which was, of course, conducted with the catch arms. I think it's easy to lose track of just how immense these structures are, and just what an absolute marvel this facility is. I was going back through some old photos and found this one of the chopsticks just before they were mounted, and with people for scale it's really clear to see just how huge they are, and it makes shots like this all the more impressive. We know that SpaceX has always had ambitions to build more than just one launch tower for Starship flights. The official render in fact has two of them side by side. Well, it looks like work is well and truly underway for a second tower, located at the SpaceX Starship site at the Kennedy Space Center, as Trevor Malham spotted a steel tower segment being transported over there that could only be used for one thing. <laughs> More parts have been spotted here and there en route as well, such as this dashcam shot of what could potentially be the booster quick disconnect hood. Here's the one that's located at Boca Chica for reference. This photograph here really highlights just how big the wide bay has become. It's really beginning to dwarf the high bay, which is massive in its own right. While it's really cool seeing the high-tech wide bay take shape, it's hard to not have a bit of a soft spot for the tents that SpaceX use for a large proportion of Starship's development, and have done so since the very beginning. It's always funny to me to see how advanced Starship is, and yet it's largely assembled in a tent with nary a clean room in sight. However, the tent's days may soon be over. It appears that SpaceX have begun laying down the foundations for a massive Starship factory building that will replace the tents as the site of fabrication for the rocket's fuselage large sections. Breaking ground has begun, and when the building's completed, it's expected to be around 300,000 square feet, or 28,000 square meters, and stand an impressive 60 feet, or 18 meters tall. A similar facility looks to be in the works at the SpaceX site at Florida. Toasty Croissant has created this great rendition of what things will look like once work is complete, based upon these official schematics of the proposed site. The structure in the foreground is Hangar X, and is believed to be dedicated largely to Falcon 9 maintenance and refurbishment, and in the background should be a fairly familiar sight to all watching, a Starship production facility complete with two high bays and a large facility that will likely resemble the tent replacement structure that's currently being assembled at Starbase Texas. Speaking of future Starship facilities, SpaceX oil rig Deimos left the port of Brownsville last week, presumably heading off to a shipyard where further work can continue converting this former deep water drilling rig into an ocean launch and landing pad, complete with its very own Mechazilla catching system. I can't wait to showcase the progress on this and be there to talk about the eventual completion and operation of this platform on space this week. If you want to make sure you stay in the loop with Starship and Space News then don't forget to subscribe down below. I make these videos every single Monday and if you drop a like if you're enjoying things so far then it's always very much appreciated. 
Thursday last week was a big day. We saw the one year anniversary where SpaceX landed their first Starship test vehicle upright. Yes, I know, it's already been an entire year since the flight of SN10. And yes, while it did land safely, it is a shame that obviously the landing wasn't entirely perfect, as things went a little bit explodey not too long after touchdown. Still, it was a landmark achievement, and SpaceX clearly learned from their mistakes when it came to the subsequent flight of SN15, a launch that we'll see the anniversary of in due time too. Hopefully, it won't be too long before we can finally get an orbital launch out of Boca Chica. So far, there's no update from the FAA regarding launch approval though, so I'm afraid we'll just have to sit tight on this one for now. No matter how long approval takes, the fact remains that Starship is going to be huge when SpaceX finally get it operational. It'll render Falcon 9 and Heavy completely obsolete, and that's certainly saying something given that these rockets are still the only reusable space vehicles currently flying. Well, I say that, but Rocket Lab have been making big strides into making their Electron rockets first stage recoverable as well. They aren't quite there yet though, and last week's Electron launch on the 28th of February was a standard expendable rocket affair, although they did perform some tests of the vehicle in their strive towards reusability, as denoted by this red stripe on the fuselage. This mission was dubbed the Owl's Night Continues, and was the first of three dedicated launches for Synspective's Strix constellation, meaning that Synspective was the only one paying for this flight. On board was their second synthetic aperture radar satellite, Strix Beta, which successfully reached its target sun-synchronous orbit with an altitude of 561 kilometers. These satellites can target data with a ground resolution of 1 to 3 meters, and work by sending microwaves from the satellite down to Earth, which then reflects back up to the satellite to generate an image of the target area. This allows for 24-hour monitoring of an area even with cloud coverage, something of course that's not really possible with traditional optical observation satellites. The mission name, Owl's Night Continues, is a nod to this ability of the satellite, and follows Rocket Lab's 2020 Owl's Night Begins mission, which launched Synspective's Strix Alpha mission. This mission was also the first operational flight from Rocket Lab's brand new Launch Pad B, a launch pad that I discussed quite a bit in last week's episode of Space This Week. Launch Pad B certainly won't be Rocket Lab's last launch pad though. Rocket Lab shared some renders on Twitter last week of the upcoming Neutron production complex and launch site, which will be located in Virginia for their upcoming Neutron launch vehicle. In case you didn't know, Neutron will be a fully reusable orbital class rocket that'll compete with the likes of Starship and other fully reusable orbital launch systems such as the Terran R and New Glenn Jarvis. Back to SpaceX related news, the company pulled off another successful Starlink launch on the 3rd of March. This is the ninth Falcon 9 launch of the first nine weeks of the year as well, which is pretty neat. The rocket deployed 47 Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit, and the first stage touched down on the drone ship Just Read the Instructions, wrapping up this booster's 11th launch and landing overall. This is in fact the third Falcon 9 first stage to complete 11 flights in total, which is amazing. I remember when I first heard that SpaceX would try and reuse boosters, I and many others thought that maybe these things would be good for two or three reflights at best. But SpaceX really are showing us all up now by not only relaunching and relanding these things into the double digits, but they've somehow made the whole affair seem frankly routine and almost mundane while they do it which I guess is the ultimate goal of the Falcon 9 program really. Speaking of Falcon 9 reflights, the next set of astronauts to fly on Dragon, Crew 4, can be seen here pictured underneath a rather sooty Falcon 9. Yep, they'll be launching on a booster that's already flown three times, making this the first time SpaceX launch astronauts on a booster's fourth flight. Interestingly, this same booster was the one used to launch Crew 3. The Crew 4 mission is planned for launch on the 15th of April this year, so it won't be too long before I can talk about it a bit more on Space This Week. Make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss out on that one. Now, moving on from last week's Starlink mission, but staying on the subject of Starlink, Elon tweeted an important message that the Constellation is now the only non-Russian communication system still working in parts of Ukraine, and is therefore likely to be targeted. He advised Ukrainian users to only use Starlink when required, and to place the antennae as far away from people as possible, light camouflage won't inhibit a Starlink antenna, and a very thin layer of spray paint would be okay too, provided that the paint contains no metal particles. This advice has come after Ukraine's Vice Prime Minister Mikhailo Fedorov urged Elon over Twitter to provide help with maintaining internet connection amid the ongoing Russian invasion of the country. Elon confirmed that the Starlink service was activated in Ukraine with more terminals en route, something later confirmed. 
In further unfortunate news regarding spaceflight and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, last week we learned that the Ukrainian-made Antonov 225 Myria, the world's largest plane and a one-of-a-kind, was destroyed during a Russian attack on the Hostomel airport. This plane had a vast history and was once used to transport the Soviet Buran spacecraft on its back, and the Soviets had plans for many uses for it, both as a spacecraft and rocket fuel transporter, and also as an airborne launch platform too. There were also plans to make a gigantic twin fuselage successor to the plane, called the Antonov AKS, a massive 18-engine diversion of the Antonov 225 that could carry large cargo and serve as a strata launch platform. I want to show you this animation that was created by the excellent YouTube channel Found and Explained. They really deserve a lot more subscribers, so go and check them out for their extensive video on the Antonov 225 and all the crazy design proposals and mission plans that were created around it. While the Antonov 225 may now be gone, there is a complete second airframe that's actually fairly complete, so hopefully maybe perhaps one day Antonov can revive this project and get a successor to the 225 flying. It is a shame that talking about this conflict is looking like it's going to continue making its way into these space news videos for a little while. And while we can mourn the loss of an aircraft, it of course pales in comparison to the needless loss of human life and the displacement of millions of people from their homes and from each other that this invasion has resulted in. At least it is reassuring that so many have stood united in support of Ukraine and many would-be customers have pulled their contracts with Soyuz, such as OneWeb, who announced that they would no longer be using Roscosmos's launch vehicles or their launch sites to continue adding satellites to their network. Furthermore, SpaceX have reprioritized their operations towards cyber defense and overcoming signal jamming, despite this causing potential delays to Starship and Starlink development. I want to move the video on now to something a little bit more positive, and that's another one of the rocket launches that we saw last week. On the 1st of March, a United Launch Alliance Atlas V launched the GOES-T satellite, a joint venture by NASA and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA for short. GOES-T is the third of the GOES-R series of weather satellites operated by NOAA, and will provide continuous imagery and atmospheric measurements of Earth's Western Hemisphere, lightning detection and mapping, solar imaging, and space weather the monitoring. These will therefore allow meteorologists to observe and predict severe weather events such as thunderstorms, tornadoes, hurricanes, flash floods, and the GOES satellites have even proven helpful in monitoring dust storms, volcanic eruptions, and forest fires. Also, it's sometimes hard to realize just how big these satellites are, since they rarely have anything near them that reveals their scale. But the GOES-T satellite is really, really big. It's about the size of a small American school bus. I'm glad to see Atlas V pull off another successful launch last week. I thought I'd sneak a quick Kerbal Space Program update into this, as I've had a few people ask about Kerbal content on this channel. Rest assured, it is coming. I'm working on a couple of Blunderbirds videos as we speak, and I have a couple of other projects in the works as well. Unfortunately, a limiting factor for KSP videos is the commentary. It takes a lot longer to record than Space this week, and so it takes a bit of a greater toll on my vocal cords, which are still recovering after my recent illness. I'm guessing you might be able to tell I'm not quite 100% back to normal yet, so please do bear with me. The Kerbal content is coming, and I think you're going to like it when it's done. Now, I'm sure many of us, myself included, own and love the LEGO Saturn V set. Well, last week, LEGO released an SLS-inspired set. Admittedly, it's no Saturn V. This one is very clearly marketed towards children. But hey, I thought I'd stick this in to lighten the mood a little, and because I don't really get to talk about SLS news very much, since the pace of this rocket's development is not only behind closed doors, but it's also very, very slow. Humorously, one of my Twitter followers pointed out the slightly cursed crew capsule in this thing. Also, Lego, if you want to send me a free SLS set, then please contact me. My social media stuff is on screen, and my girlfriend says I spend too much money on Lego, and therefore I'd really appreciate getting something for free. Anyway, I just want to now give a massive thanks to my supporters on Patreon, and of course to my subscribers who've signed up to my YouTube channel membership scheme. You guys make all this content possible with copyright claims and strikes. It's really hard to depend on ad revenue to help fund the creation of these videos, but you guys provide the solid foundation to help keep my channel running smoothly. If you want to join either my channel membership scheme or my Patreon, then you can follow the links down below or on screen. That's the end of this week's episode of Space This Week. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one.